cord to this, this computer. There we go. And I'm just going to go off. Um, I'll go on mute and I'll turn my camera off so you guys can just chat amongst yourselves. But I'm here if you need anything. All right. In theory, I should be recording right now. So thank you. Yeah, um, I was also interested, uh, I believe Unistellar is involved with some of these asteroid missions like uh, the Trojan Lucy asteroid, like uh, doing occultations ahead of, of uh, Lucy's mission to the Trojan asteroids. Yes. Uh, so we started this with Mark Bui uh, two years ago. Okay. Uh, you probably know we observe an occultation, the first occultation of the asteroid Horus from Oman. Okay. It was in two years ago, in fact. I can send you the, the date exactly. And then we did another one of, um, of Locus from California. Yeah, that's one of Lucy's targets. Well. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, and now we basically start entering the mode where we predict also those events. So we, have, uh, we are going to have a page pretty soon. Uh, in fact, this week, where we have all the occupation of uh, Lucy targets uh, for the year 2022, there is a lot of them, in fact, that could be observable with the Unistellar network or other network, and this will be make available, will be available. Uh, we're working with the Observatoire de Paris, the Lucky Star Group as well, and Marc Bouy. So something we, we're planning to do is to have this occultation predicted, so it's done, and then have those occultation refined, the past refined a few weeks before the occultation, because what happened is that Mark and other people, what they do, they take observations of the asteroid and the field of view a few weeks before. So that's allowed them to refine the, the, the orbit and also yeah. the position of the stars if it's needed. And uh, so that's refined um, the path. Um, the goal is to have um, our users to living above the path to observe, definitely, but also to organize campaign so people go to the places and yeah, yeah. Uh, like a little bit what we have been, have been doing over the years uh, with IOTA, but mo mobilize as, as well our, our network to do it. Yeah, I know most occultations involve some travel because the paths usually don't yeah. come to you. So it's yeah. a small telescope, so you can carry in the backpack. I mean, I've done it. It's kind of cool that you uh, you can just take a car, rent a car. I did that for, um, um, oh, um, no, the NEAs that had a flyby in uh, February and March. Damn it, the small no, I, one. I, I had the backpack when, when I reviewed the first original Unistellar model, yet they sent me the backpack, but that I'm, I'm impressed, even taking it up to the roof here in downtown Norfolk, that it, how small of a unit it really is to, to transport around versus even, even the other telescope I've got next to it comes apart in many more pieces, so. <laughs> but, yeah, uh, so. That's a, truly the, the strength. I mean, uh, sometimes last time I observed an occultation, the story that we were set up and uh, um, a cop came and asked us to leave the place. So we took <laughs> the telescope. I've had that happen leave. before too. Yeah, <laughs> we ran to another place along the, street, the road. We put, set up the telescope and in two minutes it was ready to observe. And we, yeah. we managed to record the occultation. So... That's an advantage to have the telescope, which is compact and integrated, to be able to do these kind of things. So other than the Lucy mission, uh, any other NASA missions you guys are working for? Uh, yeah, we, uh, we are planning to observe uh, Didymos. OK, for DART. For DART, yeah. yeah. So you know the impact will be uh, end of September, beginning of October. There's yeah, it's coming up right this year. Yeah. Uh, so the goal is to observe uh, the impact, of course, but me, maybe we will see something. We are, it's still a mystery what will be really happen to this moon. Yeah. Um, yeah. But also uh, we are working with uh, the Observatoire de Paris to observe an occultation of Didymos. There is an occultation in September that will be passing by uh, Abu Dhabi. And uh, so we see, we may, we may uh, ship some telescopes with a team there and uh, do this observation. That's a work in progress. It's very challenging, as you know, because yeah. NEAs are very small, so the occultation will last 0.2 seconds. There's usually a little be... bit of uncertainty with the pads, yeah. too. Yeah. Yeah. So they're working on that, refining this, and we are waiting for them uh, to give us some better predictions and uh, work with them. Yeah. Yeah, well, prior to about a decade or so ago, um, 
it was almost impossible. I think less than half a dozen uh, asteroid occultations had ever been successfully observed because they yeah. didn't have the computing power prior to this century even. That's, you know, in the 20th century, there was very few that it, it, it actually required. It's amazing that we can do this now. That it's almost yeah, that's a daily golden thing, age. So. There's really, truly really the golden age for occultation. With yeah. Gaia, the catalog is extremely accurate. So we have the stars at least pinpoint properly now. Then the only issue is the asteroid itself, but hey, we're getting more and more telescope time on large facilities. That's uh, true with Gaia, which, uh, it's getting more accurate too. Yeah. Yeah, so so what else, what's what's new for interstellar or unistellar in general in 2022? Like um, so you heard or... about JWST, right? Yes. That we did a big campaign. I've we seen have... some people imaging it, yeah. Yeah. So right now, I can give you the number. We have 110 people who observe JWST using the EV scope, the EV scope. Yeah. Uh, I, they, uh, I didn't quite, quite try for it because I saw it was fainter than 12th magnitude is what, about what I can get here in downtown. Yeah. So I found it was a little fainter than that. So I haven't tried for JWST myself. So what was very really, really interesting is that I work with the STSCI team and uh, we kind of... Uh, decide when to maximize the of, number of observations so we can see the opening of the sun shield. So we see a change of brightness. Yes, For I've sure, I see that on the data. But we also now have this mysterious that probably you heard about that. The light curve of uh, JWST is extremely variable in amplitude. Oh, I hadn't, no, I hadn't heard about that. It, it basically has a... It flashes regularly every uh, six hours or something like this. And uh, we have recording this flash as well with the uh, with our uh, Unistellar network and multiple observers who did that. Um, so why this is flash this flash is happening? Well, we think it's the orientation of the system of the of, of the spacecraft. You know, the spacecraft is stable; it's not moving. Yeah, yeah. That's a mistake I made with STSCI, and, and they told me in absolutely no way we're not rotating. It's yeah. very stable in space, but Earth is orbiting, is spinning. So there is a moment for which the observer on Earth will basically see the reflect the glint of the solar panel. Ah, it's the it's the basically the motion yeah. of the observer on Earth as it turns. Exactly, it's taking a glint from it. So it's kind of nice. If if the spacecraft stays like this, it may be possible to observe it all the way to the L two. Interesting. That should be this coming weekend. I was yeah. just talking with one of my editors saying 29, 29 days after launch is. Yes. 24th 23rd that's this weekend so i haven't seen a press conference for it but they they should be doing a uh jwst is at l2 uh celebrate like there should be a press release for it no I, i'd seen it brightening but i assume that was just with the deployment i hadn't seen that there was anything else anomalous with it that's yeah yeah there is something else so it's kind of it's and you know people uh our communities they're excited about the fact that they see this and they part they kind of connect to the JWST. So it's very good outreach. Yeah. And it's also good science because learning how those glint happen and the, why they happen could be useful in the future when we want to monitor more and more of those satellites, uh, especially the constellations, for instance. I, I, I was going to. I was going to say, speaking of satellites, I was thinking of that. I saw an ISS pass while I was doing a 1994 uh, PC1 last night. And I was thinking, ha has there been any uh, ideas to use this to track satellites too? We are, we are thinking about that. Um, tracking could be uh, possible in the future. Uh, that may be implemented. Um, we're discussing with the SATCOM team of NSF. Uh, to see how we could use our telescopes to um, uh, monitor the brightness of the Starlink satellites and others, ah, the okay. new one as well. Because as you know, there is this uh, debate about whether yes. or not they will pollute uh, the dark sky. And there is some uh, idea about how to minimize this. So NSF or SATCON, we need some data. And uh, I think our telescopes can observe any Starlight satellite without problem. Yeah. We have done that multiple times already. So we'll be able to, um, to monitor them and to measure the brightness of them. So Interesting. that's a big project. And that's not something which is on the top of our list. Yeah. But yeah. if there is funding coming from NSF to do this, we will probably apply to kind of be able to use this network. I know low Earth satellites will probably be tricky to do because the, their orbits evolve pretty quick. 
Yeah. But uh, but yeah, even stuff up in Geo, you probably could track pretty easily with this. Yeah. Interesting. There's something else tracking satellites. Oh, um, the, the one thing I noticed is in order to get data for the Unistellar, like to get your actual raw um, raw files and, and PNG files and things like that, is there every any idea to put those like at some kind of cloud accessed server? I noticed yes. the, the system right now is to send an email off and then they send you a file. And and uh, I, uh, a friend of mine was saying they should just put this out somewhere like, like something on the cloud where you have a password and you just go in and find your data and you can access it. Like that's so if, the, if you want that's, your... Your raw that's files. That's a working progress. Yeah, that's okay. a working progress. Okay. It's not that easy when you have seven thousand telescopes. <laughs> it's generating <laughs> a lot of data, I imagine. Yeah. Generating a lot of data. Yeah. But that's a working progress, and we're hoping to have this very, uh, very soon. Uh, so people, it's also will save me a lot of my time because I also do a lot of sending data for, from the science group to our citizens astronomers. So we love not to have to do this, frankly. So yeah. we are all pushing for that. It's gonna come. Um, the priority of the company was really to develop the telescopes, the Eviscope 2, the Screenox, diversify the number of the products we have with different price, price range. And, uh, but now we know that the software is also an important part. The network is truly uh, the big, big project for us. Yeah. Is there anything beyond the EV scope two, or is that primarily where I know that just came out too? So, yeah, the EV scope two just came out. So we just we are still like in a mode of adapting the EV in fully integrating the EV scope two into the science. Uh, it's a slightly different detector, different uh, uh, electronics on board. So we are tuning our science uh, algorithm to be able to handle the EV scope two. Right now we have some detection of, I mean, it does work for almost every uh, every case we had. So that's not a big problem, but uh, having that data on the server is also the priority. Then next, I cannot tell you, we have ideas. We have, yeah. uh, you have multiple ideas as you know, but uh, I cannot tell you anything yet. Until you, you know, uh, one human element I noticed using this, I've been showing this off at public star parties now that we can do public star parties again. Um, the first time I brought it out there, people were kind of lukewarm because I was showing them, well, this, they, they were like, oh, you're looking at something on your phone. And I'm like, no, this is from the telescope beaming it to the phone. This is still live. There was mm -hmm. kind of that disconnect. I found the second time I brought it out, I put a physical clamp with the phone on the telescope, like on the leg. I mean, it's a tiny thing, but then they kind of grasped more that the phone was a unit with the telescope. And then, well, yeah. and then they were in, in one plus side is I, I turned kids loose on it and they had a blast just dialing around and finding objects. I mean, they totally, they totally got it once, uh, once kids saw it and started playing with it. So it was interesting though, that, that there, there's kind of a disconnect where people are like, well, that's just something you're looking at online on your phone. And I'm like, I, I kind of had to convince them. And of course, the, the not the horizon or the equinox, but the first EV scope had an actual little eyepiece on the side. Mm -hmm. It's funny when I reviewed it, I didn't know that was an eyepiece at first. So I did a video saying there was no eyepiece. And then somebody told me, <laughs> oh no, that turret is an eyepiece. So, and I popped it off one night and like, oh, there is a little screen in there. Cool. But of course, well, you know, the, the equinox doesn't have an eye. I'm Not actually equinox. correct on that saying there's no eyepiece on it. So yeah, yeah, the equinox is truly, um, it's really the perfect telescope for the science, I will say as well, because you can do in, you can basically have a, you have more memory on both. So that's that was a, a full at the time. Yeah. To, to multiple observation of transit and occultation over the week, and then you transfer the data. And also, yeah, we don't need an eyepiece to do the science. It's mostly. Uh, and, and I think I mentioned my review. One thing that occurred to me is I've used telescopes back from the 70s on upwards. So I went through every iteration of go to scopes. They had the, the push and pull and point ones and, and things. And I will say this was the first one. I, I turned my neighbor loose on this, who was pretty, you know, internet savvy, tech savvy, but knew nothing about the sky. And he was able to just Wi-Fi bond to the, the with his own phone and use it. And it's one of the first ones I've seen that literally out of the box worked 
most other go-tos I had used over the years, you could get them to work, but you need some technical, when it points at the ground, you need to be able to troubleshoot and know why mm -hmm. uh, it's, if it's not balanced right, or it's not the pointing accuracy is off. You got a polar line and repolar line. This one doesn't require any, it, it totally, one of the first telescopes I've used out of the box, it just worked the way it was supposed to. So that alone, I think is pretty impressive. Well, I'm glad you like it and yeah, you yeah. use it too, which is very, the important part, and I think we mentioned that, is that we're not, we're not a company which is building telescopes. That's not the way, that's not where we see each other. We are a company that developed astronomy, democratizing astronomy, so people enjoy the dark sky. So it can be with the telescope, it can be with the app. We have an app now as well. But why really we want people to buy the telescope, they use it. They use it often and they enjoy yeah. showing it around. Uh, because it's fun. I mean, there is so many things happening in the dark sky. Look at this week. It's nonsense, non non-stop. Every week, every day, there is something new. So. Oh, yeah. I, I couldn't even envision in an urban area like this, if I had a big enough porch area with a good view of the sky, having a little mini shed over this thing and just controlling it from my laptop or tablet indoors and have something the top pops off and it just goes mm -hmm. and observes. So I could see this in a, in a mini uh, a little turret kind of uh, self-contained observatory, even even downtown, like uh, you just need a little patio to pop it onto. Yeah, I'm observing from San Francisco. Okay. All the time. The only issue I have with San Francisco is the fog. The rest yeah, yeah, of yeah. the time I can observe. So. Okay, I, I think that's good. Like I said, I'll probably do this for next week and I want to concentrate basically on, on what Unistellar is, is doing in 2022 for, uh, there's a lot online on, on your guys' site too, for, okay. for uh, what kind of science observations you guys are doing. I think that's what really sets this project apart from what I see with other their smart scopes and telescope companies and what, what's going on, so. You, uh, if you have any questions, you know how to contact me. Yes. Lauren also can do the, can send you material, uh, pictures. Mm -hmm. If you That's want something true. new, I can send you uh, some new stuff. I think we have a video of JWST uh, flashing. Yeah, certainly. Uh, I will, can send you this. Uh, Lauren, remind me in case I, I forget, but I will do that. Okay? No worries. I'll send you a reminder tomorrow. Okay. Excellent. All good. right. It was good talking to you. All right. Well, you take care. I hope to see you. <laughs> maybe we go to NIF, NIF this year, finally. Oh, basically. I hope so. Yeah. So maybe I will see you there. Okay. Okay. Cool. Thank you All so right, much, guys. Very... Stopped. All I'm right. Sure, you've got your recording. Okay. Uh, it looks like it's still recording. Let's see if I can find where it went. Okay, stop.